The MLB All-Star Game is here, and we are taking a look at the state of the league as well as some of the big storylines from the game, the draft, and the home run derby. Plus, League One may have narrowly avoided a crisis, a minor league team is relocating after seven decades in one location, and Sunday was an incredible sports day for the country of Spain. It's Tuesday, July 16th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. League One, France's top soccer league, may have averted a potential crisis. The league is finally closing in on domestic media deals with the Zone and BN Sports, according to Bloomberg. The league has still not announced media deals for its upcoming season, which starts in August. Media rights are the financial lifeblood of the league's 18 teams, and to not know how much is coming in from those deals at this point puts those teams in an incredibly challenging situation. The league was initially asking for $1.1 billion annually, but got no takers at that amount. They are hoping to generate interest from Amazon, Canal Plus, BN Sports, DAZN, and possibly Apple, according to The Athletic. The situation didn't come out of nowhere. The league's previous media deals brought in Spanish broadcaster Media Pro, which angered Canal Plus, which had a long-term relationship with the league. That move backfired almost immediately when Media Pro pulled out of the deal a few months into its first season. League One brought in Amazon as a stopgap at a deal worth $272.4 million per season. That was understood to be a discount price given the circumstances, but what full price should be now was still an unsettled question uncomfortably close to the start of the season. The Modesto Nuts are leaving Modesto. The single-A team of the Seattle Mariners had been mandated by MLB to make an estimated $32 million in improvements to its John Thurman field. The Mariners were unable to come to an agreement with the city of Modesto, and so rather than pay the equivalent of a year and a half of Julio Rodriguez's salary, the team will find a new home for their affiliate. The Nuts, named for the many nuts that are grown in the Central California area, have played at John Thurman Field since 1955. The Mariners only became an MLB team in 1977. Prior to becoming a Mariners affiliate, the Nuts have been in the organizations of the Rockies, Oakland A's, St. Louis Cardinals, Kansas City A's, Houston Cult 45s, Yankees, Milwaukee Braves, Pittsburgh Pirates, and St. Louis Browns. The Mariners, which took full ownership of the team in 2020, have not said where their single A affiliate will be located after the Nuts lease expires in September. And finally, Sunday was one of the best days in Spain's history when it comes to international sports competitions. The country's national team, of course, won the Euros. Spaniard Carlos Alcaraz defeated Novak Djokovic to take the Wimbledon singles title. Not only that, but a Spanish team won the Sail GP Championship, and Sergio Garcia won Live Golf's Andalusia Tournament. Not bad for a single day. The MLB All-Star Game is upon us. Joining me live from Globe of Life Field in Arlington, Texas, is Foreign Office Sports Newsletter co-author Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Great to have you on, especially on location. So the National League is starting pitcher uh, is Paul Skeens, who last year was selected as the first overall pick by the Pittsburgh Pirates. Usually the top draft draft choice from a year before is, you know, maybe in double A at this point. Um, what do you take from Skeens, not just being a viable major leaguer, but a star? Oh, it's a huge development for the league on a multiple levels. There is the kind of celebrity social media aspect where he's, girlfriend Livy Dunn are sort of right. like the Taylor and Travis of baseball. So there's that whole sort of pop culture element. But in terms of a sort of strict hardball player development standpoint, we're in kind of a new era now that there was just at the draft Sunday night and there is a heightened emphasis on college players who are deemed to be more major league ready, thanks in part to the increased quality of the college level of play. Um, but there's a general sentiment that if between that and better minor league facilities and a number of other trends that this three, four, sometimes even five year apprenticeship that a lot of these guys need to make in the minors is no longer necessary. That schemes and others to a lesser degree have sort of opened the door that um, maybe just a matter of months is really all that's necessary to bring some of these top talents along. Yeah, I was just looking at the draft, and I'll, I'll admit I don't really know the names, but what really popped out was the first eight picks are uh, all from college, and used to be much more of a mix of college and high school. And nine out of the, and nine out of the top ten. Yeah, and uh, and I've I've long thought that yeah, basketball and football have this huge advantage of you can get excited through the whole pipeline because you know Caleb Williams or you know, name your your top NFL or NBA draft picks. Um, 
they're expected to be in in the big leagues in you know in the NBA and the NFL and contribute right away and be really good. Um, like when the Spurs got Victor Wembanyama, it's not like okay, well we'll see him in two three years and hope he's still good. Um, you know he's he's a top player right now. Um, and baseball is not really structured that way, but maybe it is restructuring itself more in that direction. It's definitely moving closer to that direction. The nature of the sport is still a little bit different and it's still an everyday sport and there's still a jump to the next level and all that sort of thing. Um, but the, the gap is definitely narrowing. And again, like I was saying, Skeens has kind of helped to open a door and maybe uh, promote a different way of thinking in terms of how player development happens. Yeah, and I have to think that's it's getting down to the colleges themselves, to the you know the the top baseball schools. Um, you know, not just thinking of themselves as, I mean, obviously they're trying to make the best players they can, but you know, it, it sort of sets the bar higher at least uh, to see that your players could go straight from that school essentially to to the major leagues in yeah in a few months. Yeah, and and again the rising level of uh, play and, and facilities and all of that and NIL and all the big trends happening across college sports and are now really elevating the level of play at, uh, at in college baseball. This really factors into that because these teams are drafting these players and the Guardians with Travis Bassana, hopefully it will or be an, another example of that, that they're essentially almost turnkey prospects that they're pretty much ready to go and again if the league gets its way and the guardians get their way we're going to have another situation like that where he's going to be ready to go in in short order and again thanks in part to some of the improvements we've seen at the college game yeah and as as long as we're mentioning Bazana, we should acknowledge it's the first time the Guardians have had the first overall pick, and also their first in the in the AL, AL Central. Um, and also, this is the first, I think, the first Australian player to be picked uh, in the first round, let alone the first overall pick. And um, uh, so, yeah, we've got a, a few firsts. Yeah, came, came over. Uh, he played. He played his high school ball in Sydney, but came over to the states. And um, you know, he's been here three years, and has basically been a dominant force at the collegiate level. Tore up the Cape Cod League, and uh, he's had a good long look by American scouts, and so that sort of gave again that level of comfort. Yeah, you know, use that word turnkey, and um, that there's you know a sort of a really polished player here that the guardians are getting yeah uh let's hop over to our all-star game weekend event the home run derby um so this is something that you know is kind of a, a fun sideshow of you know if you're a baseball fan you know back in the day maybe you, you tune in and it had its moments you know like sammy sosa going off you know and others but um but yet yeah, it's starting to become more of a you know like a developed media product a hundred percent in in a lot of ways the home run derby night kind of like all-star Saturday night in basketball is more fun than the baseball game itself. Cause it's so different and are in such a departure from a normal game, even a normal exhibition game, like the all-star game. And, you know, was looking at some numbers that a decade, a decade ago, the home run derby had slightly less than half of the television audience of the all-star game, the final night. Um, We'll see what the final numbers are for this year. But in 2023, that gap had narrowed where to the point where the uh, Home Run Derby did 87% of the All-Star Game uh, audience. And the ticket markets on, uh, on the secondary market, the ticket prices are essentially equal. Uh, buzz, essentially equal. The, the, these events are sort of shoulder to shoulder now. And whereas... You know, I certainly can easily remember where the home run derby used sideshow, and that's a good it's sort of like the little brother of the week um, in terms of the scope of events. It's it's really right there, shoulder to shoulder with um, the All Star Game itself. And again, if you ask a lot of fans, arguably just more fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just for me personally, I'll say that with the All Star Game, it's fun. Um, you know, it's it's fun seeing all the best players in one place, or you know, most of them anyway. Um, but you, you never quite know how seriously they're taking the game. Obviously, no one wants to get injured. These players, you know, they're they're playing each other. There's no more mystique around the NL versus the AL because it's all kind of one league right now anyway. We, we Yeah, we have everyday interleague now. Yeah. 
MLB is trying to make the Home Run Derby like this traveling product through I, it's, it was called Home Run Derby X, this like thing with like Andrew Jones and um, you know other other like retired players and softball players. Um, so yeah, it it makes sense that like this they're making the big Home Run Derby, you know, something that they're they're playing into more. Yeah, and let's not forget the one million dollar prize that was bulked up five years ago. Um, that used to be one hundred twenty five thousand dollars that, you know, this is serious money. Now, even for guys making, you know, good money now, you know, a million dollars for a couple hours of work, uh, you know, it's it's a big deal. And, you know, we've heard stories of people, you know, prior winners uh, paying for their weddings and building houses and, you know, big life events based on their home run derby winnings. And it's it's a big deal. And that sort of helps to fuel in that sort of competitiveness. Um versus that sort of more exhibition-y feel that you quickly point out for the main game. And this is, you know, roughly the midpoint of the season. Let's just kind of like zoom out a little bit on on MLB, just like viewership, attendance. What's um, what's this kind of the state of the game at this point, a couple of years into like the pitch clock era? Strong and healthy. Um, there were big increases last year, of course, because of the new rules, particularly the pitch clock that were very warmly received by the fans. And if you look at the uh, ratings and the attendance for this year, all in the low to mid single digit percentage gain. And so everything that was achieved last year is held plus a little bit on top of that. And so Rob Manfred on down the commissioner. They're all feeling very good uh, in terms of where things are trending. Cause again, all of those gains have from last year have held and then some, and um, there's uh, there's just a general feeling out there that there is a more approachable, more attractive product for the fan. Before we let you go last year, I, I think I quizzed you a couple times on, um, or I got you to predict uh, Shohei Otani's, um future contract and um if you do it in like you know 2024 $20, dollars or whatever it, you you basically got it um it's no one no one was saying 700 million exactly anyway the next big name here juan soto uh, you got the team absolutely correct and um and yeah i i, I give you like a you know 95 percent credit on your your predictions there yeah because that 700 number was just so out there that nobody could have gotten your point is well. I, I, I appreciate the plaudits. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. if you had said that he's going to get two million dollars a year for ten years, and then sixty-eight million dollars, I would assume you're a time traveler because, yeah, I don't think anyone saw that coming. Um, anyway, Juan Soto uh, currently, you know, destroying baseballs for the Yankees. He's twenty-five right now. Um, what what kind of range are are we looking at here in terms of like what he could get as a free agent? So writ large, we're looking at the probably the second biggest contract in all of U.S. pro sports, uh, team sports behind Shohei Otani. So um, quite possibly even beyond Mahomes' record, uh, sort of lay out a similar projection. I'm going to call right now staying with the Yankees at $525 million. That feels like a solid projection. Yeah, team, um, as a Mets fan, I... Don't love it, but I think you are accurate. Uh, number sounds about right too. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a lot of weight on the Aaron Judge uh, marketing pr promotional campaign that the two of them are getting along very well on and off the field. Obviously, having a one-two punch there in the in the middle, they're basically the only guys hitting in the Yankees lineup. Um, and so I I think Judge successfully puts on the hard sell to get um, not only. Soto to stay, but also owner Hal Steinbrenner to open up his wall and get it done. Yeah, and I know this isn't the George Steinbrenner Yankees, but like the Yankees aren't the Yankees if they don't just like, you know, basically pull a Dodgers with Otani and just like go get their guy here. I mean, like this him and, and Judge are, are, like you said, just holding up that lineup. Yeah, and, we, and we've already seen a small sample of just the individual days when Soto's not in the lineup. You know, there were a couple of hit by pitches and he took a day off and all that sort of just even in that limited instance, you see just how dramatically different a team that is without Soto in the lineup. All right. Well, we'll have a few months to, to let that play out. Uh, I don't think he's signing an extension yes. before the season. But, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll hold you to that. 525 with the Yankees. Sounds about right. Yep. Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend who you think would like it too, and make sure you're subscribed wherever you like to tune in. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.